somewhere along in there. They felt strongly enough that they had offered a 20,000 pound prize for discovery of the North pa Northwest Passage by way of Hudson Bay, and many, many parties set out out of Hudson Bay looking for that, and that would ultimately prove futile. The theoretical geographers of the time had definitely convinced the Admiralty that the passage existed because of tales of imagined and mystical voyages passed down through the ages. <clears throat> Both Spanish and Russian traders had been sailing along the northwest coast of America for decades. There had been no maps until Jacob von Stalin published an account of a map of two modest voyages conducted for the Russian Navy by Lieutenant Ivan Sent and Captains Peter Krinsian and Mikhail Levishev in 1764 to 1769. Although these voyages did little to expand geographic knowledge of the Bering Sea or the Alaska mainland, the von Stalin map suggested Alaska was a large island between North America and the Asian continents. Among other things, the map showed Stent's New Northern Archipelago with many other islands and a wide passage into the Arctic waters between Alaska and North America, making it appear that the Arctic, <coughs> even Hudson Bay, was relatively accessible from southern Alaska. <coughs> In Captain Cook's detail of the third voyage, the instructions from the Admiralty um, began that somewhere 65 north latitude, the Admiralty assumed that von Stott's account and map were believable. After reaching the South Pacific, Cook and his men sailed for America to find since Archipelago and to claim the 20,000 pound prize. They came in view of the Oregon coastline on March 7, 1778, sighting and naming Cape Foulweather, as you can see by the weather in our video, <laughs> an aptly named place. Before they were besieged by high winds and vicious seas that forced them south to Cape Blanco. As they came south, they mapped much of the coast for the first time, including where a lot of this video is taken here along Cook's Chasm and Thor's Well. After a considerable battering off the coast of Oregon and Washington, they sailed north along the coast, passing the outlets of the Columbia River, Straits of Juan de Fuca, while far out to sea, they could not find shelter until they reached modern-day British Columbia at a place they called King George Sound. While they assumed the rocky windswept shore was part of the continental landmass, the anchorage, which soon became known as Nootka Sound, is located on the exposed west coast of Vancouver Island. They stopped in the inlet for water and wood, as well as recock and refit the vessels, which by this time were worm-eaten and in severe need of a refit. They found the region densely forested from the water's edge to the distant snow-capped mountains. As soon as they entered the inlet, melodious whooping was heard from shore. In an instant, a few hundred native canoes came out in 30 or 40 massive cedar canoes. Imagine big cedar trees, the, the kinds that you know an entire family of five can't get their arms around, being dug out into canoes holding 50 people. Uh, these are what came out to Greek Cook at the time, uh, during these storm-swept storm times. The people were clothed in animal skin and smeared with paint, so they were not as attractive to the English as the exotic islanders the crew had seen in the South Pacific, Hawaii and Tahiti. But on first approach, they stood in their dugout canoes and sang in wild chorus. Some held rattles and waved their arms, pointing at the sky and the shore. Others threw colorful ochres, ochres into the sky and even danced in their excitement. It was an uncommon raucous welcoming ceremony. The English soon learned about the Nuka people and wrote at length about their customs in their journals. And I'd like to... From the Journal of Henry Roberts, six weeks of ship's duties, bearings, coordinates, winds, and weather, the Discovery and Company. And again, I am reading from Captain Cook's Final Voyage, the untold story from the journals of James Burney and Henry Roberts. Uh, it's 
a great book, and I recommend it highly. It uh, is uh, edited by James Barnett, forward by Richard Neville, and the introduction by Glenn Williams and by the WSU Press. Journal of Henry Roberts. Monday, February 9th, 1778. Saw a grampus, whale, and some flying fish and shearwaters about. People employed picking of oakum and working up junk. Sailmakers mending the worn sails and carpenters on the boats, which received much damage from the surf at the late islands. Tuesday, 10th, February. Found a very sensible difference in the weather. The wind veering to the round of the north renders the air much cooler as the thermometer falls. And we are definitely in the northwest there, aren't we, folks? As soon as that wind starts coming out of the north, it, it gets cold here in a hurry. Wednesday, February 11th. Served a cask of spruce beer to the people brewed from the essence that we bought from New Zealand. And they've been bringing these supplies with them across the Pacific. Remember, they left out of England and didn't go around Cape Horn. They went the long way through Australia and the Straits of Endeavor. <clears throat> Monday, February 16th. Found one of the starboard iron threads broke, owing to the strain occasioned by the main topsail mast tack. Knotted the shrouds and fixed the slight spar, athwart the hole to make each shroud to have an equal strain. With a thimble to haul the tack down by, people employed picking of oakum. And these are just, you know, the, the way they would write their logs in the time. Sun, Saturday the 7th. Uh, this would now be uh, March 7th. A swell from the northwest. Pass much sea wreck or rock weed. A number of seals and birds about, chiefly gulls, a number of whales seen. At daybreak, saw the land and made signal to the discovery. The low land shoe itself first, the high points being covered in a fog and haze, which soon cleared away and appeared very hilly and mountainous, but could not perceive any parts covered in the snow. Many seals and large flocks of birds about us. So this would be about the time they were finding uh, Cape Foul weather. A heavy squall from the northwest, a number of seals, this is Sunday, then the very next day. Uh, a heavy squall from the northwest, a number of seals and porpoises about the ship, and many birds, gulls, gannets, and large kind of brown petrels. The extreme of the land from north-northeast to southeast by a quarter south, offshore in about five leagues. Um, this would be the west coast of North, North America. The weather being very squally and unsettled, and much the appearance of dirt and blowing hard. Likewise, we perceived no bay or harbor to shelter us. We tacked and stood off, carrying a press of sail to help ourselves from being embayed. Distance offshore, six to seven leagues. Embayed means blown into the shore. So they were, they were going north into a northwest wind with... A rocky lee shore on the right side of them. So these sh these ships don't sail to windward very well at all. Uh, they hardly sail to windward at all. So they would have been fighting six or seven leagues, about four and a half miles off the coast, three and a half to four and a half miles off the coast. They'd have been fighting into the wind on these big square riggers with <laughs> with worm-eaten hulls after this this year and a half at sea, trying to beat off of these rocks. Um, that you see here that are just, just being exposed on a day very much like you're seeing here in the video. Uh, it would have been would have been terrifying, frankly. Um, it would have been very, very terrifying and and almost impossible to do. It would have required an enormous amount of seamanship. And if you remember, just a few days before, well, a few weeks before, they were fixing torn, tattered sails and scaring up oakum so they could press it in to fill leaks in their ship. So what these guys were facing during this time was nothing short of amazing. Monday the 9th. The weather very unsettled. Strong gales and hard squalls. At 1, a severe squall of wind came in and continued about a half hour, obliging us to take the double reefs in each topsail. No land in sight. Tuesday the 10th. No land to be seen. Very few birds about and no seals. So they had definitely worked in the deeper water by this time. If you're not seeing birds and seals on the northwest coast, 
then you're probably 10 to 15 miles out to sea at least, especially in bad weather. Wednesday the 11th, squally weather with hail and sleet. A heavy swell at the northwest passed a large log of wood. Saw the land in extreme bearing from northeast to southeast quarter east. In the morning, stood in for land, making in a bluff head with sharp cliffs with a fresh gale from the northwest. So <clears throat> I want to point something out here. Heavy swell at northwest past a large log of wood. Um, we call them deadheads out here uh, on the west coast, and it's not at all unusual. As the floods sweep down every spring from the snow melt in the rivers, they wash out huge trees in the rivers, which eventually work their ways out into the ocean. And some of these logs are, you know, uh, seven, eight feet in diameter or more. Uh, even the ones that are a foot or two in diameter easily poke a hole in the boat. And they're very hard to see, especially especially in heavy weather uh, with lots of chop and foam on the, on the waves. Extremely hard to see. And if they were to hit your boat, it would be the same as running your boat into rocks. Uh, many boats have been lost out here from hitting logs in the water. And uh, that's why he notes that in his log, because it was definitely uh, something that could have killed them very easily. Here he's describing um, their, their, their sight on land there. There alarmed us much just as before break of day by one of the sailors calling out breakers, but proved to be nothing more than white sands appearing through the haze. This part of the coast has a nearly north-south true being straight without the appearance of bay or inland. So now they're down south at this point. They're, they're coming down um, trying to get back into good weather, and they've entered the area of um, you know Florence, Newport, uh, Reedsport area here, and they're seeing the sand dunes uh, and the straightness of the coast, which which had to be <laughs> a, a lot a lot uh, more comforting than the rocks of the northern coast. Fresh wind, squally with hail. This is Thursday the twelfth at half past eleven. Taken aback with a squall of wind and with unsettling weather in the northwest, split the main top staysail and the squalls extremely severe got downwind saw a water spout heavy squalls came on suddenly friday the 13th hard squalls with snow and sleet very unsettled weather saw a seal saturday the 14th fresh gale squally rain heavy weather friday the 20th a number of whales and porpoises round the ship smoked the bread room and with brimstone and killed a vast number of cockroaches these cursed vermin are not so destructive as when we were in hot climates, but they are still infested with all manner of roaches, rats, bugs, bed bugs. The, these voyages were extremely hard on the crew, the men. And it didn't matter if you were an officer or um, a jack staff before the mast, it, the, the bugs didn't care. The bugs didn't see any kind of hierarchy in the men that they were going to be eating on throughout these voyages. The bugs are starved, and they're going to eat on everybody. And so they were constantly trying to kill these bugs off with a number of different ways. And when they say they uh, they they smoke the room with brimstone, they it's a it's an awful thing that they do, and it's a, an acrid acrid smoke that they put out to try to kill these bugs and uh, take care of these people. Just just a horrible horrible. Deal. Let's see. Uh, Monday the 23rd. Fresh breezes and squally with hail. At 6, the extremists from northwest to west to east-southeast, the northern part, which appeared to be a detached island or deep inlet, was about 9 leagues off a high rock, marking the Mew Stones, about 5 leagues, a high ground hill inland offshore, about 6 leagues. The land well covered with wood and to appearance very fertile, many levels and gradually rising to the summit of the hills. No snow to be seen, a heavy sea and showers with hail. Monday the 30th, saw two appearances of inlets and bore away for the latter, Nootka Sound. At three, had soundings from 24 to 17 fathoms, then abreast of the mouth a deep sound with 30 to 50 fathoms of water. 
And remember, a fathom is six foot, so 50 times six foot. And they're they're getting these by by launching a lead line, and we'll go over that later on in some of our other videos on on how a lead line works and and how you launch one. But but basically, it's a, a leaded weight with a string on it with marks on it about every quarter fathom, um, and there'll be four four quarters to each fathom, and they're they're finding the depth at 50 fathoms. That's a lot of a lot of string to be pulling up and down, and it's not string; it's actually pretty heavy cordage rope. Um, Hoisted boats out to tow her further in, so they put their boats out to tow the ship further in and up the, the, the sound. Several canoes at this time round us, immediately offering their few trifles they had with them for sale. Now these, these folks were used to trading already with Spanish and Russian traders who had been coming up and down the coast for decades now. These were not the first white men they saw. Cook, Cook though he's to, to credited with discovering much of uh, the west coast of the Americas, was just the first to have a really well-published map of the west coast of the United States. Again, the Russians and the Spanish had been going up and down this coast for, for decades um, and, and, frankly, knew their way quite well up and down the coast. So, at any rate, they have now made it to Natuka Sound, where they're going to spend some time fixing up their boats and making things better. From here, Cook would go on up uh, into Alaska and reach the ice. Um, he would look around as much as he could and he would explore a little bit of the Kamchatka Peninsula trying to find that Northwest Passage but he would find it choked with ice the whole way. At this point uh, with the, the summer coming to an end uh, Cook would finally head back south to Hawaii thinking that uh, things were as he had left them which was fairly friendly. What he would find was a tribe had uh, had had some discussion since he was gone, and that a new chief had taken over. And when he got back, he would not find himself nearly as friendly, uh, or nearly friendly companies as before. And it would be there in Hawaii that Cook would die. His executive, which would take over the ship, would go back up to Alaska again, looking for the passage, and they would actually winter over one more time on the Kamchatka Peninsula before they would, he would die. He would die of an illness while he was up there. And the next officer to take over as captain of the Discovery and, and the Discovery voyage would finally sail him back home. This was Cook's third and final voyage, of which he didn't live through. Um, and we owe him much. Uh, his charts and maps are still here. If you drive up and down the Oregon coast, uh, you will discover many places that, that Cook has been uh, pretty much from the California-Oregon border all the way up to uh, the Bering Sea. Uh, and it would be Cook's maps that Bering would use to chart and discover the Bering Sea and the Bering Passage. I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this short adventure with us on Sea Stories. We'll be doing many, many more of these. Uh, I have a lot of Sea Stories. I spent many years at sea. Some of these will be my own. Some will be other people's. Uh, we'll be following along with the Coast Guard and some merchant ships, and even some oceanographic research vessels and some stories from those. I have a lot of friends that have a lot of really good sea stories, and from time to time we may be reading theirs, or we may ask them to actually come and share them with us. I hope to have some beautiful video for you along the way, and I really hope you guys enjoyed this. Thank you a lot, and please like and subscribe. It makes a huge difference, and if you don't do anything else, at least share this video. Uh, that's the best thing you can do for this channel right now. We're trying to build it up and make it bigger, and I hope you guys are enjoying it. Thank you again, and have a great day.